Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome again to this first uh, Stoller Chair Technical Sessions in the, in the second day. Uh, we are going to start because we are late. We are late, to be honest. Uh, despite of we have some, some colleagues that come from South Africa that are early arriving. Um, in this second session, we are going to trade uh, a really important subject such as um, nutrient use efficiency and water use efficiency is much more in this climate change uh, context. As the same way that we did yesterday, we are going to structure the, um, the, the, the session in two presentations during the morning. And after the break, we will develop two more. And once more, we, we are really grateful to, to the speakers that are going to share with us all the different knowledge that they reach along this, um, these last years. And uh, at the first step, we are going to, to develop the, present, uh, the presentation uh, about uh, devices and predictive methods that will be developed by by uh, um, Dr. Trevor Wignall. Um, I want to remind you, remember you, that uh, you have coffee services along all the session. And once we decide to, to break, if you have any kind of intolerance, you have to report directly to the register table, just when you get out on the right. Dr. Trevor William is PhD in plant physiology from the University of London, which he completed at East Mailing Researching Station, currently working as operations manager of the Water Efficiency Technologies Wet Center at NIAPS at East Mailing in the UK. KMs of the work are to increase various product productivity resilience and sustainability while reducing waste and emission to land, air and water, and to provide scientific evidence to support the industry in, tra in transitioning towards net zero emissions goals. For the first 15 years of his career, Trevor worked for a global energy company on the propagation and physiology of trees for re renewable energy, energy and sustainable timber production. He had held senior executive roles for global companies of different sectors such as pharmaceutical, facilities management, technological, and smart buildings and digital workplaces. Dr. Trevor will, Wignell will develop his presentation, Climate Smart Berries, Resilience and Resource Use Efficiency in Soft Fruits Productions, where it will be faced predictive models and devices to control soft fruits quality and yield rates in a maximum efficiency context. You can go forward, Trevor. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias todos. Um, thank you to Stoller Europe and the University Politecnica de Valencia for the invitation and for this uh, opportunity to talk to you this morning. Can you all hear me at the back? No? I need to speak up a bit, OK. Um, my voice is a little croaky after the uh, entertainment last night, so uh, apologies for that. Um, so we're going to have a, a change of uh, crop today because uh, we heard a lot about vines yesterday. So I'm going to be talking to you about strawberries and raspberries this morning. Um, but we faced many of the same challenges and issues with uh, climate change, and the conservation and efficient use of scarce resources. To begin with, I'd like to give you a bit of uh, background and uh, our objectives for the, the Water Efficient Technology Centre or WET Centre that I look after at East Morling. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we've done with water, particularly precision irrigation and rainwater harvesting. And then I'm going to move on to some of our current research activities, um, looking especially at uh, nutrient demand and low nitrogen systems, resource planning, uh, this is yield forecasting to uh, allow better use of uh, resources, and then uh, finally a little bit about the phytoclimate and the importance of light. 
So the wet centre was set up in 2017 at the request of uh, the soft fruit industry growers in the UK. They felt there was a need for a, a centre that could provide demonstration of best practice and the opportunity to research uh, innovative ideas. And uh, it actually builds very well on the reputation of... I'll turn this one off. Is that better? Okay. Uh, yeah, it builds very well on the, the reputation of East Malling, which has uh, been there for over 100 years now. And uh, similarly, back in that time, was set up by local apple and pear growers. And um, the output of East Malling is known throughout the world. The uh, apple varieties, the rootstocks, uh, uh, can be found uh, worldwide. Um, and we're basically set up as uh, three departments. Uh, and it's now run by the National Institute of Agricultural Botany. And we have the three groups. So uh, plant physiology and production systems, which I'm part of. Then we have our entomology and pathology group. Um, who help advise on pests and disease. And then we have the, the plant breeding section. And uh, I'll say a little bit about some of the varieties as we go along, but certainly happy to answer any questions on that later. Uh, as you can see, the, the wet center is basically a polytunnel setup. And uh, while I'm on this slide, we've got uh, four fairly standard polythene tunnels, very typical of a grower setup in the UK. Um, and then on the right-hand side, what we call our advanced area that has um, automated venting. You can see the doors, and um, it's, that's where the rainwater harvesting system is as well. Um, we, as well as that sort of demand, if you like, from the growers, um, obviously we need to fund the whole thing. And so we set it up as a consortium with a number of partners, and, and you can see their logos here. Um, so very happy that uh, Stoller is one of those working with us on the biostimulant side of things. We have Yara um, on the uh, sort of fertilizer and agrochemicals. Netafim who provide the uh, irrigation system. Uh, Delta T who are providing a lot of the technology I'm going to talk about. Coco Green, we, we grow our strawberries in uh, cocoa fiber. Um, and Berry Gardens, uh, who are a producer of uh, varieties of plants, and they also provide an agronomy service for us. And then we've got some associate partners. Uh, WeatherQuest um, provides satellite uh, weather and climate information, and Hutchinson's uh, also provides some advisory services. And then I've put the uh, Innovate UK logo up there. Quite a lot of our Funding comes from uh, putting bids into government for uh, Innovate UK projects. Um, as I'm sure you'll understand, anything that talks about sustainability, net zero, or carbon neutral these days seems to attract funding. So uh, We also operate um, a precision irrigation package. Uh, we're working with about 24 growers, I think it is, in the UK now, who... Um, have uh, some of the precision irrigation technologies that I'm going to talk about, and we provide advisory services to help them set it up and uh, get the best out of it. I realize I didn't talk a lot about the, uh, the words up there, but uh, I think I probably did cover most of that. The layout, as you saw, was the, the eight tunnels. The left-hand part was the uh, commercial area. Then we've got the advanced side. We're using precision irrigation, using a lot of uh, sensor technology, um, measuring light, temperatures, uh, relative humidity, and in the bags, actually, the uh, soil moisture, um, electrical conductivity, and temperature again. Um, throughout the season, we're doing destructive harvesting and uh, nutrient analysis of the plant material. Uh, all sorts of measurements of leaf area, and then you know when it comes to the fruit, um, size, dimensions, weight, uh, sugar acid ratios, and bricks, um, firmness, color, etc., uh, shelf life. 
Um, again, I think I've mentioned most of this, the uh, cocoa green. The, this is the um, Netafim Octajet irrigation rig. So it's got eight channels. One of them is used for acidification. Um, so that means we've got seven different uh, combinations of uh, treatment that we can apply through the uh, fertigation system. We're using uh, Stoller nutritional products and doing research with uh, Stoller on those. Um, we have uh, the rainwater harvesting, which I'll talk about a bit more. And uh, I've already mentioned the environmental controls. And at the moment, the strawberry variety that you can see here is Mauling Champion, one that was uh, bred at East Mauling. The reason we're still working with that one is that we wanted a three-year continuity of uh, research so we can compare year to year. Next year, we, we'll be switching to Mauling Ace, which is a, a newer variety. Um, so this is a typical sort of plan. So each tunnel has six rows, and those are also split in half. So uh, we can do statistically validated blocking of uh, treatments. Um, and uh, the little symbols indicate where we've got various uh, sensors and technology. Some of it's Delta T, some of it's Decadagon. There are many manufacturers of, of these um, types of equipment now. And uh, you know, by having them on here, I'm not necessarily endorsing any of them. That Many of them work extremely well. OK, precision irrigation of crops then. So traditionally, uh, Strawberries were grown in soil, and I believe in the USA that's still the, the main way that they're grown. But uh, in much of Europe now, we've moved over to the, um, the gutter or um, tabletop system. One of the drivers for that was um, the products that uh, were used to sterilize the soil and fumigate the soil are no longer acceptable in the EU. Um, and so it's much harder to control the pests and diseases associated with soil-grown crops. But it has many other benefits. Um, by moving to the tabletop, it's much easier for uh, farm staff to, to manage the crop. Uh, no back-breaking work sort of bending down anymore. So the crop is presented nicely. So in terms of managing the foliage and the uh, strawberry trusses, it's much more comfortable. Um, it's better ventilated, so there are uh, fewer um, fungal problems. And um, it allows us to move to uh, more controlled irrigation and uh, fertilizer use. Uh, as you can see, it's a valuable business. Um, 653 million pounds uh, in last year, but we still import a similar if not slightly more. So there's uh, opportunity to um, grow this market in the UK. Um, this is Mauling Champion. It's, it's interesting how the growing system has evolved and the breeders have brought the strawberry along with it. So we've kind of got this parallel evolution. Uh, Mauling Champion is suited very well to these tabletops. And um, as you can see from these pictures here, it has uh, quite vertical growing leaf structure, and the trusses present nicely out over the side of the bag onto the tape. So it's very easy and convenient for managing it and picking it, which uh, helps the pickers be more efficient. And then, um, which one? There's a pointer on here, isn't there? Yeah, we've got, uh, this is one of our weather stations. Here we've got the, the rain gauges uh, measuring the runoff. And this is a Delta T SM150T, which would normally be inserted fully into the bag, and that measures the uh, pore moisture in the coir, uh, the EC, and the uh, temperature. OK, so what is precision irrigation? Well, it's really about matching supply to demand. Um, so we're conserving water by sort of targeting what the plant actually needs. And we're also minimizing runoff. Uh, we try to keep to less than 5% in the strawberries, a little higher in the raspberries. Um, this kind of irrigation system, by optimizing the water and nutrition, helps with the health. We have very little um, pest and disease issues. Uh, where we do have uh, thrips, uh, occasionally we're using uh, beneficial predators. Um, 
it uh, optimizes class one yields, fruit quality, and um, the strings and the, the tabletop structure optimizes sort of light interception. So how do we do this? Um, plant water use varies hugely, up to 13-fold, depending on you know, weather conditions, and it can change hour to hour. So um, many growers are using timed systems, which um, just actually wastes a lot of water. We had a very good illustration of this um, last year. Uh, each year we have a, a, a big event at uh, East Morning called Fruit Focus. It's the, the biggest fruit show in the UK. And um, it was 31 degrees on the first day. And um, then we had a massive thunderstorm came through. And the temperature dropped by more than 10 degrees. It went down to something like 17 degrees. And huge deluge, which caused flooding on the field. And our irrigation just stopped for the rest of the day. It had been working really hard in the 31 degrees of heat all morning. Lunchtime, it just stopped. Now, for many growers, that would have just carried on on a timed system, you know, providing unnecessary water. The other thing to note is that uh, this system avoids stress. And as we heard yesterday, you know, plants are very sensitive to this. And um, raspberries have a long memory. Uh, if you even stress them to a point that isn't visible to us, but we can detect it with the sensors, their yield will be depressed many weeks later. So as I was saying, there are lots of uh, manufacturers of equipment that you would need to uh, run a system like this. And um, they're all pretty good. They all have their pros and cons. Um, but the biggest thing is the technology transfer. And you know, this is why we work with uh, growers to, to help them set it up and use it properly. Um, so you've got uh, yeah, soil moisture potentiometers, um, the uh, irrigation rig system. This is one of the types of sensors we are using for um, EC and uh, moisture. And then data is gathered through data loggers and uh, put together in a, a cloud-type report of some sort. And uh, this is the setup that we're using. So we are working with Delta, oh, sorry, let's go back. Delta T, who are pro providing us with um, the SM150T sensor, um, their GP2 data logger, and it's all connected up to a cloud report system. And uh, that in combination with the uh, Netafim rig and uh, runoff uh, gauges. This is a rain gauge connected also to the GP2 to measure the runoff side of things. So as the bags dry down, we, we set a threshold in the, um, in the GP2 logger, say 63% moisture, for example. Um, the system takes an average across the multiple sensors so uh, avoiding you know, a particular dry spot or anything in the tunnel. Um, and when the um, trigger point is reached, it sends a signal to the rig, which uh, then delivers irrigation, and it continuously monitors it. So you can have single shot, multi-shot, so it gets it back to uh, the target um, moisture level, as you can see here. And this is a, a multi-shot sort of example. OK. And all this is on the dashboard that you can have on your phone, a tablet. So, uh, you know, while I'm here, I can keep an eye on what's happening back at home. <laughs> and uh, e this has gone even further now um, with uh, Netafim's uh, NetBeat. You can actually change tanks, adjust the amount that's coming into the irrigation system. So, um, you know, in the old days, you might get a, a phone call from someone or, or even on here see that you know, there was a problem and have to go in. Now you can actually do a, a great deal from a remote location. So what are the benefits? Well, consistency in berry yields and quality, and as I'm going to come on to later, you know, harvesting, uh, forecasting yields is extremely important. Um, it makes better use of uh, staff time. We don't have to you know, walk through the crop as much as you might have to otherwise. It's still important for husbandry purposes, but not so much for checking irrigation. Informed decision-making. 
um, less time spent on uh, management of the crop because it's not overgrowing or struggling. Reduced picking costs, it makes uh, you know, the, the harvest very efficient. And uh, because we're saving water and the feed is in the water, we're saving on water and fertilizer costs. Um, for retailers, improved consistency. Um, we're doing all the shelf life tests and so on, so they know they're going to get a consistent crop. And um, hopefully the consumers are enjoying it. So a little bit of data around this, the water productivity. So um, typically, soil-grown crops need less moisture because they're benefiting from the, the moisture in the soil. So um, substrate-grown crops do tend to use you know, maybe twice as much. But when you look at the, um, the uh, sort of cubic meters per tonne, this is from uh, a number of growers from uh, Berry Gardens uh, set up. Um, the average in substrate is uh, 82 cubic meters of water per tonne of fruit. With our precision irrigation system, we're achieving around sort of 42, I guess that is on average. Um, so about a 50% uh, improvement. Um, as you see, we're kind of using a similar amount of water, but we're just getting much more fruit for that water. Rainwater harvesting. So um, everyone thinks of the UK as a wet place, <laughs> um, but it's not true. And, and it's changing. You know, this is the thing with climate change. We're getting the same uh, you know, erratic sort of weather patterns and uh, less predictable than it used to be. And uh, this is the largest reservoir in the south of England uh, 10 years ago, almost dried up completely. Um, and similarly, this one up in the north. Um, but we've also got a lot of uh, development going on in the UK, again, particularly to the south of London, a lot more housing. So there's much more demand for water. Um, and we're having uh, changes to the, the laws around uh, abstraction and costs of that are going up. So conserving water is becoming increasingly important. And as you saw from the last slide, the move from soil to substrate has increased that demand for water in the crops as well. But you know, this is a scary statistic for me, that only 27% 20 of uh, our water bodies are, are considered of good status in the UK. So this is quite a worry. Um, and we've all hear more these days about you know, supply chains, food security. This is a, a worry for us too. And so we need to do things to uh, ensure our resilience to continue supply good food. Um, I kind of covered this, but it's just an illustration to show that uh, substrate-grown strawberries use a lot more water than their uh, field-grown equivalent. And similarly for raspberries. So we set out, really, to um, do a bit of research around rainwater harvesting. I mean, it, you know, it makes a lot of sense, but we wanted to look at, um, is it possible? Uh, what's the cost benefit and, and uh, the, the practicalities of it? So um, we built a 150 cubic meter tank um, as a reservoir. Uh, we have a sump tank that takes uh, 10 cubic meters and then pumps it to the main tank. And uh, the one two sets of tunnels actually, the advanced area in the strawberries and the raspberry tunnels have um, this gutter system. The water drains down here, goes into the sump and then gets pumped into here and then that is directly uh, fed to the uh, irrigation um, Netafim rig. <coughs> so uh, in 2018 when we did this, um, we had 357 millimetres of rainfall during the growing season and uh, we had an 85% sort of efficiency of uh, collecting what fell. We started the season with the tank full because we'd collected it over the winter. And um, so all that side of it was working well. Um, there are other benefits actually that have come from this because um, there's uh, you know, better drainage, that the water isn't just falling off the sides and making the, you know, the soil soggy around the tunnels. So this has improved the, the humidity within the tunnels and actually has been of a benefit with uh, things like botrytis and mildew. 
um, and there's uh, you know, less soil erosion and uh, compaction around the tunnels. Um, what I really wanted to point out of here was that actually that year, it was quite a cool start to the year, and so we didn't use very much water in the beginning, and so there were several rainfall events where we just couldn't collect the water because our tank was already full. So one of the sort of learnings from this is that to be completely self-sufficient, we need about 400 cubic meters, which is absolutely possible in this part of the UK or where I'm from in the UK. Um, we have plenty of rainfall to uh, make us self-sufficient and indeed the whole research station. So um, we're now in negotiations with the, the site owners to, to build a reservoir to, because this is a problem that is only going to get worse. Um, other side benefits, um, the mains tap water. So if we run out of um, rainwater, we can top up the tank with uh, mains water. Um, and we also have a creek that we can abstract from. But the rainwater is much nicer to work with. It has less buffering capacity, and so it needs a lot less acid to uh, get the right pH. So we've uh, currently been working on um, reduced nutrient additions. Again, this is a major cost to growers. And most agronomists, I think it's fair to say, tend to take a belt and braces kind of approach. And we are mostly putting too much of everything on our plants. And um, so we've set out to uh, look at you know, what you can uh, reduce that by and still not impact yields. Um, but then we want to take that a little bit further. And um, we're working with uh, EDT to develop um, iron-specific electrodes for N, P, and K. And we're looking at those ions on the input side and also in the runoff to try and work out what the plant is actually using of what it's being supplied with. And um, putting that through an artificial intelligence system, uh, we're working with Netafim, who want to move towards what they call straights, just so rather than uh, fertilizer mixes, straight uh, compounds, and to be able to, you know, precisely supply the plant with what it's asking for, if you like. Uh, so that's the end goal, and it all fits in with the idea of reducing emissions. Um, so we're doing this with uh, Raspberry, um, Morling Bella, another of our locally uh, developed varieties and uh, Netafim with their rig and, as I said, uh, EDT with the uh, iron-specific sensors. And, and this is kind of a, a schematic of what it might look like. So, um, as I was saying, we've got the, uh, the straights, if you like, from the fertilizer side, although obviously there would actually have to be another tank with your micronutrients and so on, because we've only got the N, P, and K here. But um, uh, the... Uh, Sensors in the, the coir would um, detect the levels of uh, these ions in the input side and in the runoff side, and then going through uh, a black box of uh, artificial intelligence, it will uh, tell the rig you know, what the plants are, are asking for. So that's the theory, and uh, I think it's going to be a, a long journey, but we are making some very good progress. So... Um, the first step was really to develop uh, a nitrogen demand model for the raspberry. And um, this has been done based on some work done here in Spain, actually, on tomatoes uh, by the, this so-called VegSyst model, where you predict dry matter production from thermal time. And then from that dry matter, you work out the uh, percentage nitrogen. And uh, you're able to then sort of predict how the plant will grow. And um, we find that in most things we've looked at, strawberries and raspberries in particular, same as with the tomatoes, early in life they use less nitrogen and then it sort of ramps up as you move towards a, a larger plant, makes sense, and uh, fruit production. So we calibrated that model last year for Morning Bella. This year we're um, actually testing it out by applying um, low-end feeds and um, we're working with uh, EDT on their sensors. So the N and K sensors are very good. Um, the phosphate has a few issues, and we're trying to get it all into one robust 
package for field use. So the, the early versions were measuring millivolts, which we then had to put into a spreadsheet, to calculate the PPMs, and come back. Now that is all built into the software in the, the handheld meter. And then the ultimate uh, will be to actually have a, a field deployable continuous monitoring. So I think there are going to be some interesting challenges around that to do with you know, dealing with high temperatures, disease, fungus, bacteria that might want to grow in these solutions. So uh, yeah, some interesting stuff to come on this. Um, yield harvesting, which uh, again, there's a lot of uh, cost, if you like, tied up in this. So um, growers have to provide forecasts to their wholesalers and uh, they may well be under contract to deliver so many you know, tons of fruit or trays of fruit. And if they don't, there can be penalties. So uh, this is of great interest to the industry. Um, again, this is one that's uh, part funded by Innovate UK, and we've got an, a number of partners involved, including the University of Re um, Reading, Thorvald, who uh, develops uh, robotic systems, uh, CropDesk, who have a, a software for uh, managing sort of pickers and, and yield, and uh, we're using their algorithms to put uh, our fruit measurement data in to sort of help predict the harvest. And of course, um, climatic data is key, and uh, Berry Gardens, who uh, run a lot of growers in the UK, are very interested in the outcome of this. So uh, we're looking at yield predictions and uh, managing the uh, sort of phytoclimate to help achieve this. So degree days are used quite widely for predicting uh, yield. And there's a sort of generic model which says four and a half degrees for strawberries. Well, you know, as you can see from this data here, when we tested that, actually for Morling Champion, um, 5.8 degrees gives you a much better outcome. So that's just a, an illustration of um, how existing models uh, are not working particularly well. And so there's great opportunity to um, do this better. Um, and indeed, not all parts of the tunnels are the same. So this is why we want to get uh, you know, more intelligent, if you like, about uh, this work. So you can see here the, um, the six rows in one tunnel, the sort of variation in uh, temperature at different times of the day is enough to be significant and uh, cause a difference in rate of, rate of ripening. And here's some data uh, to show that. Um, basically, the middle rows, sort of three and four, tend to produce more fruit than uh, the, the edge rows. And, and this is significant. So why is this? Because they're all getting the same feed. They're all managed in the same way. Well, that brings me on to my next topic, the importance of light. So this actually looks at um, two contrasting years. Um, 2020 was an exceptional year for sunlight in the UK. And uh, you can see from this WeatherQuest data, which just maps the last 10 years, 20, I know it's a bit hard to see the, the key, but uh, 2020 is this one at the top. So uh, we had higher sunlight levels than we'd had for more than 10 years in 2020. And yet in 2021, we went to the other extreme and we had the poorest summer that we've had for a long time. And this is very clearly reflected in the yield of the fruit. Um, 2020, although a good year for sunbathing and in lots of other ways, it presented interesting challenges. The, the trusses grew so vigorously, we, we had a kinking problem, which is why I introduced the second uh, support tape that you might have spotted. Um, but that issue went away last year because uh, you know, things just weren't growing as uh, quickly. So um, we know that increasing light levels above the uh, compensation point, uh, then growth of the plants is proportional to that. And indeed, we know that plants are most synthetic, photosynthetically active first thing in the morning. So it's quite important to get your maximum light levels possible onto your plants in the early hours of the day. Um, so for this reason, we're starting to look at uh, smart venting and, and other ways to achieve that. Um, 
just one other little thing to point out. Um, the simple tunnel actually has higher light levels than the more advanced one. So while there are adva advantages of that advanced model in terms of venting and uh, temperature control, actually the light levels are higher in the simple one. This is because um, the vents have more metal work and also we've got the rainwater harvesting gutter. So at times of day, these are casting shadows on the fruit. And, um, you know, 5% is uh, s significant in terms of income. So, yeah, as I say, this um, illustrates how light levels actually vary in those six rows at different times in a single day. And you can see as the sun moves across, perhaps moves behind the, the bars in the roof structure, you, you get dips in photosynthetically active radiation. Um, and as you go through the day, this one, for example, it's uh, low this side. And then as the sun gets into the afternoon, it's, it's higher. And um, so this is how the vents look. So what we're doing at the moment is, again, using uh, a smart box. We're measuring sort of light levels and VPD. And instead of, um, so let me just explain. The vents actually go up in three stages. So you reach the first VPD threshold, and they'll go up a third of the way. Then the next one, they go up two thirds, and then to fully open. What we're planning to do with this um, smart technology is actually lift them on the east side early in the morning. So instead of them both going up one third, this side will go up two thirds and allow the light, uh, the sunlight in in the early part of the day. And then uh, during the middle of the day, they can both come up. And then in the evening, the west side will open more. Um, and we're also looking at light reflective mulches. So we've put um, white mipex down in uh, some of the tunnels to uh, see if we can reflect back more light. We already know that the, um, the white bags for the coir have some effect. Um, Cocoa Green also make them in black bags. And um, ideally, we'd like a bag that starts the season black and then fades to white in the middle of the season because the black bags actually raise the temperature and help with plant establishment early in the year. But then there is a risk of uh, them overheating the roots later in the middle of the growing season. So as I say, the ideal would be a, a bag that starts black and then turns white. But uh, I think that's going to be a, an interesting challenge. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, finally, um, I wanted to just say a little bit about some work we've been doing with a, a total, total controlled environment agricultural system. So this is basically it's a growth room with artificial lighting. And uh, again, just to illustrate how important light is. So this is also Morling Champion. It was planted in April 2021, and it's still in there, and it's still yielding. When I put this slide together, we'd just gone through six flushes. I think we're on seven now. And um, these are producing, on average, 2.4 kilos of plant. But we've had more than three kilos off some of them. So given the right sort of feed, water and light and of course you know we, we have diurnal changes it's completely a controlled environment we can provide winter chilling in there as well but these same plants will keep going I, I don't know when they're going to stop some of the older leaves look a bit tired and we take those off and they just produce more so um, one of the developments I would like to pursue at the wet center is to put up one of these polycarbonate greenhouses um, like the Cravo system with a retractable roof so that we can start on the shoulders of the season early and late with artificial light to get the plants well established and then retract the roof and benefit from the uh, natural light in the summer. And we think this could help us to uh, you know, extend the growing season at both ends. So uh, yeah, what next? I've, I've covered some of this, um, developing the smart venting a bit further. Um, Moving on from the, the low end, you know, looking at uh, targeted nutrition requirements at different developmental stages of the plant. And indeed, um, it's not only variety, but also how you manage the plants. So, for example, in uh, raspberry, uh, primer, gain, primer canes versus uh, floricanes, um, you know, even if it's the same variety, it's a totally different structure to the plant. So they like to have different requirements. I'm interested in you know, recycling of growing media because um, you know, 
10, 15 years ago, growing crops in coir was quite a niche thing, and it's getting more popular. And so where's all that coir coming from? It started as a byproduct of the coconut industry, but I think we're now getting to the stage where you know, there's a risk of, um, like we saw with oil palm, of you know, forests being cut down just to plant coconuts to support this kind of industry. So I think we need to look at ways of uh, reusing it, and there's some sort of interesting work going on around that. Um, I mentioned our work with uh, Stoller around biostimulants, and uh, particularly under these low input systems to, you know, where we may be inducing a bit more stress, can these products uh, help support us with a, a low end model, for example. Further improvement of the, the yield forecasting, and then, um, doing whatever we can to help the uh, soft fruit industry in the UK transition to net zero emissions. Uh, just some acknowledgements. Um, my department head, Mark Els, who uh, oversees a lot of this work, and um, the farm team at East Morling, who uh, helped keep the, the wet centre looking really fantastic and uh, will be harvesting today while I'm here talking to you. And uh, the Berry Gardens Growers Agronomy team, who provide the advice Thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Trevor. I think it's a really interesting presentation. Um, it's time for questions. I've, I, I, as you know, I have, <laughs> I have one for you. Um, well, I think, I think it's clear from your presentation that this is one of the key points in order to ensure a, a nutrient use efficiency and a water use efficiency, even more for a water use efficiency from my point of view, right? Um, I think this is a smart approach for, for, for the crop management. My, my question is, do you think that we can translate, we can, we can uh, put all these devices in, in and productive methods um, apply directly with some other crops? Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, our work is mostly with um, strawberries and raspberries, but uh, well, there's two aspects to it. One, you know, we've got this uh, PIP package that we've deployed to growers. So I think often with these kind of things, it's that technology transfer that uh, is where the problems arise. And if it doesn't work for somebody, it then can very quickly get a bad reputation. So as well as the, you know, the technology, I think it's that sort of um, support and advice and uh, site visits to help the growers get it established. But then to answer your question more directly, you know, definitely this works with other crops. So we, at East Morning, we have projects with uh, field beans, uh, aubergines. Um, we've deployed this in the field for uh, plums and cherries now, even in soil-grown crops. Um, so you, slightly different sensors, but you, know, you certainly can measure um, the soil water potential in uh, soil as well. So uh, yeah, absolutely, it can be used for pretty much anything. And uh, actually, because um, we were talking about the vines yesterday, and I've obviously focused very much on this uh, soft fruit, but we have a, a research vineyard in the UK. A couple of the presentations yesterday were talking about the UK being in that sort of blue zone and uh, potential for vines. And so we are doing exactly that kind of work. We've got um, many different varieties in trials and also on different rootstocks to see uh, what is going to be best to grow in the south of England. Um, and we're deploying the same technology. So we've got um, frost protection and uh, fertigation uh, underneath them as well. So, um, you know, if you're interested, you're very welcome to come and see what we're doing in that regard. And uh, certainly all around where I live, uh, near to East Morling in the southeast, fields that used to have apples or hops for the brewing industry, there's more and more of it is now being planted to vines. So, uh, yeah, that's definitely coming. And then we've got the, still the top fruit, the apples, pears, and we've got a demonstration plum orchard. So, you know, you're always welcome to come and uh, have a look around if you're in the UK. Okay. Any other questions from the attenders? Oh, okay. Could anybody pass the, the microphone to the oh. attender, please? This one from here. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, Trevor, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. I, I, I expect some about that, but my question uh, for you is, are there some uh, physiological measurements integrated to the monitoring system in this whole thing? Because uh, I, as far as I understand, uh, understood, uh, all the measurements is based on the environment condition of the plants, but uh, 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 in the physiological responses to the, uh, of the plants to, 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 to this control systems, do, do you are uh, measuring something? So, so, so for instance, my, my, uh, my worry is you are trying to, to, to create a, a very advanced system to control light, but in the photosynthetic responses to the plants, because as far as I, I, I have um, research in, in my area, uh, extremely constant conditions are, are not the best for the plants because plants need some complexity in the environment to, to increase the, the physiological efficiency. So yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that very constant conditions all the time is the best for the, the, the maximum uh, productivity in plants. Yeah, okay. So, well, a couple of things. Um, perhaps I have mis um, misled you to believe it's a constant environment. Um, whilst we are controlling, you know, light and water and so on, it's, it's not... It's got diurnal changes and uh, different uh, wavelengths to make um, natural light conditions as much as possible. But you're certainly right in that um, whilst we're doing, you know, things like leaf area measurements, um, photosynthetic sort of measurements, stomatal uh, resistance and these kind of things. Um, actually, one of the reasons I asked you a question yesterday is I'm very interested in the, uh, you know, electrical type signals that you were looking at um, because I think we are very focused on the mitochondria um, and not so much the plant other than, you know, destructive harvests and the, these kind of things. So I would be very interested to know more about, you know, what's going on in the plant. And, um, yeah, I guess it's actually finding the right tools to do that. So, and that was why I was asking about, you know, have you got plans to commercialise uh, the sort of research uh, that you're doing? Because I think that would be very useful to us. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I'm making Any a lot of noise. Any other question? Here. So here, yeah, okay. <clears throat> Trevor, thanks very much for that. Um, a really good presentation. We know from experience the, uh, the good work being done at the Wet Centre. And anybody who's involved in soft fruit or has soft fruit growers in their markets, I suggest a visit uh, to the Wet Centre. <laughs> and you know, we'll, we'll try and discuss within the company to organize some visits there, because the work they're doing is uh, cutting edge. It's, it's trying to find all these new technologies, grow better strawberries with uh, less nutrients, less water. So this is definitely the way forward. Drop just a question. Thank um, you for the plug. <laughs> I'm expecting some money outside, <laughs> or, or a beer tonight. You, you know. Drew, how, how close are we to being able to bring all this important data to sort of singular interfaces for commercial production. So being able to use telemetry, et cetera, mm. even maybe some of the work that Gustavo is doing, to sort yeah. of bring these different dimensions together. Yeah, so it's, um, it's a topic that's of great interest to me, and uh, you maybe sort of gleaned from the, the introduction that I sort of had a break from being a plant physiologist for about 20 years and went into corporate real estate, and um, which is all about data, really. So my scientific skills fitted very well there. But um, I was interested in exactly this kind of thing because you had, you know, finance systems, uh, sales systems, and then building management systems. And um, 
I developed a, a tool to actually bring data, HR data, all these things together so that we could see, you know, this was with Pfizer, so a global pharmaceutical company, um, buildings, you know, in 80 odd countries. And I was just getting questions all the time about, you know, who have we got here? How much does, what's the, um, how much is it costing us? So I just put all that into a big cloud report and um, allowed sort of other executives to sort of start making decisions. Um, and I think we need to do the same here because Delta T have their cloud, uh, Netafim have developed theirs, WeatherQuest have got theirs, you know, and so on. Uh, I use a hydrogen peroxide water treatment system. They've got their own system. And I think really we need to start uh, sort of pooling this together because um, growers haven't got the time to go logging into, you know, half a dozen different websites to look at all this different stuff. Um, and it's, it's actually pretty easy to do. Um, it's just having the, um, the right people to help you put it together, really. So it's not that close, I would say. I, I think it'll be quick when, if we get the right sort of funding and the right group of people together to do it. And I did make a bit of a start on it last year. And then uh, the IT guy I was working with left. <laughs> so, um, so I think it will come. But uh, yeah, I can't give you a date yet. OK, thank you, thank very, you very much, much. Trevor. Okay. We will proceed. We will move forward for the following presentation. It will be developed by Dr. Ron Salzman. His BA by the Department of Botany, University of Wisconsin, MS, Department of, of Horticulture uh, and Purdue University, PhD, Department of, of Horticulture in the same university, Currently working as global director of Discovery Research and Stoller Enterprises, and is part and collaborates with the Department of Soil and Crops in Texas AMM University. Postdoctoral research at the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics in Texas AMM University. Research teaching assistant at the Department of, of Horticulture at Purdue University, research technician at the Department of Forestry, University of Wisconsin, molecular biology technician at the Department of Pharma uh, Pharmacology at the same university, um, developed, have developed um, a great, uh, great work in development of gene prescriptions for genetic resistance to fungal pathogen in grape by USDA CSREES and has collaborated in a huge number of scientific publications and studies, always focused in plant pathology and resistance defense pathway and plant physiological processes. Dr. Ron Salzman will develop his presentation, Role for Cytokinins in Plant Reproduction Under Heat Stress improving plant resistance to high temperature in a warming world, where will be faced the stress effects in plant development from a physiological point of view, always focusing on some phytohormones role along the critical vegetative stages. This is your turn, Ron. Thank you very much, Vicente. Everyone can hear okay? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And also thank you to the organizers, the rest of the organizers for this fine symposium and also for uh, University of Valencia for hosting us. Sorry, Ron. Yeah. It's not good? Would you please review the, 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 the volume, please? Yeah, I guess this one is not working, so. How is this now? Can you hear? Yeah, much better. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, again, thank you to Vicente and to all the organizers and to the University of Valencia for hosting us. And uh, as, as Vicente mentioned, um, I'm going to talk about the uh, part of the climate change aspect, uh, specifically the heat, uh, uh, the heat problems that plants have, uh, and um, kind of do it in a little bit more detailed fashion, perhaps. Um, I do discovery research for the company Stoller, and so 
you know, in, to, in order to do this, you kind of have to focus deeply into a subject. So I'm going to try to give you a, a view of one of these type of projects where we, where we have to uh, look into the details, um, but I'll hopefully do it in a way that's, that's uh, understandable. Um, and again, the, the, the subject is about the, the problems that plants go through under, under uh, high temperatures, specifically due, uh, during red, uh, reproductive stage. I will kind of divide my talk into three parts. The first one is kind of a broad view of the, the problem from the plant's point of view, uh, and also from you know, the production point of view of growers. And then also, a uh, second time, I will go in a bit more detail, kind of a journey inside the plant about how the metabolic pathways are affected and uh, specifically involving this, this reproduction problem. And then I'll uh, move for the third part into the sort of the field results. How do we apply the knowledge we gained about the, uh, the details inside the plant? Uh, how do we apply that to, to solving, helping solve these problems? Well, um, we've had this problem in Europe as well as the rest of the world for, for some years now, and it's already been in the news for many years. Um, this was in 2019. Um, the BBC is uh, showing us that uh, we have these record temperatures, and I'm sure that you, those of you who live in Spain knew all about this, but, um, um, and again, uh, it was great to hear the, the talks from uh, Dr. Compres and uh, De Aralde yesterday. I, when I made this talk, I didn't realize that people were going to be talking specifically about grapes, and I'm, I'm grateful for that, but I just used it uh, briefly as a, uh, as a way to show people one of the examples of the problem, uh, the crops that are affected and how that changes the culture and changes what we come to know as, you know, the things we appreciate in life. So, for example, uh, champagne. Everybody likes champagne, I guess. And uh, this is kind of where champagne is produced here in uh, northern France. But if you overlay this map of wine production in France with the, the, the one I just showed you from, last, uh, from 2019, you can see that the temperatures were <laughs> quite extreme here for, for the Champagne. This is really more like uh, Jerez de la Frontera, no? So <laughs> you can't make Champagne in Jerez, right? So this is, this is an example of how uh, and how De Geralde spoke yesterday, we're going to maybe be forced to change our styles and our, our approach to wine. I hope not, but maybe. Uh, but of course, it doesn't only affect grapes and wine. It affects, uh, it affects all kinds of crops and in fact, at all levels from subsistence agriculture as we, we see in, in many parts of the world, um, especially in areas where they have very limited ability to, to to supply water, uh, this is this is going to cause massive food problems uh, for a lot of people with uh, limited resources, um, and it's likely to get worse and worse as as time goes on. But uh, even in the highly developed countries uh, where most of the food production is made, um, it's a serious problem, and it's and it's going to have an, a, a dramatic impact as well. For example, here. We see a paper from a couple of years ago from the National Academy of Sciences where, of the US where um, they show in this paper the effect of high temperature. Well, temperature is shown on the x-axis in each case. And then these graphs show the yield uh, of corn, soybeans, and cotton under the different temperature conditions. So as you can see, when you reach um, when you reach temperatures that are sort of at a threshold, in this case it's about 25 to 30 C, you suddenly get a dramatic decrease in yield. Yeah, and it affects all these, all these plants at their own respective temperatures. Um, so it's a serious problem and you know, it, needs, it needs to be uh, brought to notice of everybody. And what do we do about this? You know, it's, it's difficult because you can't, you can't make the, the atmosphere cooler. So the approach that you know, we took is to try to understand what's happening inside the plant, what is the, the details of what goes wrong in a plant 
especially during reproduction when you have high temperatures. Um, there are, as you notice here, there are critical limits uh, or critical temperatures during pollination. Uh, this is the time when I was focusing for, for the rest of my talk here. I'm, I'm focusing on the time period during pollination because this is one of the, the very big weakness periods uh, when heat can be very damaging. So you see that all of these major crops have their specific um, levels of heat or thresholds of heat during which um, if you go hotter than that, you will reach uh, significant damage during the, uh, the reproductive uh, yield. So uh, as it says here, yield is, is damaged by high temperatures at flowering time. So there have been several studies done uh, in past years where they more or less looked at uh, artificial atmosphere uh, treatments to see how that uh, affects yield. And as you can see in this one, uh, the control plants here with the, the dark dots give a, a, a much better and more significantly higher uh, yield than, the, uh, than the, the ones that were treated with a uh, 35 degree centigrade daytime and a 25 degree C night. So, you know, we know that this happens in the field, but in order to approach this in a scientific way, we, we sometimes want to look at uh, artificial systems to test specific inputs and specific uh, stages of this problem. Um, so one of the things that can happen is that uh, a lot of the internal processes of plants are, are directed by, by hormones, natural plant hormones, and we can call this a hormone balance. Now, it doesn't mean that the hormones are all the same level during the whole life cycle. No, not at all. They change dramatically from one to another during the time of development. And of course they change because they are the, these hormones are the signals that are telling the plant what to do now, you know, and how to change as they go through their life and how to change in response to the environment. Um, so, um, but one of the, the problems that I mentioned is that we can have damage during pollination. And one of the, uh, one of the key hormonal factors in the plant that is, uh, I believe, is involved with this uh, damage to reproduction is, is cytokinins. So that's going to be the, the kind of the, one of the focus of my talk here. What, ha what can happen here is um, if you have a plant that's got a, a, a favorable uh, temperature regime, 25 C during the, the day and 15 C at night, uh, you will get a, a, a large amount of cytokinin produced in the, this is in wheat, for example, during, in the wheat grain, you will have a naturally high production of cytokinin. However, if you, if you treat that plant with the 35 and 25 C day and night, you will see you get a dramatic decrease in the, in the level of cytokinin. Okay, so this is a problem. This is the, the, pro, the uh, access that I'm working on, the access point to try to go into a, a way of solving this problem. I'm focusing on the cytokinin levels, okay? So cytokinins have several different functions in plants. Um, many of you may know already, but their name, the, the name cytokinin comes from cell division. So it promotes cell division in plants. When a, when a, a grain or a fruit is just beginning to develop, a lot of cell division is happening to increase the number of cells. So cytokinin is, is super important in that uh, process. It also promotes uh, bud outgrowth during the spring or when a branch is being formed and you want to have more buds, more, more branches, you will need this. Uh, you also uh, have cytokinin with a major role in uh, keeping the plant green or uh, delaying senescence. If you uh, take away cytokinin, or the plant can become senescent, but if you, if you furnish more, it can delay the senescence. But uh, another thing that's not quite so well known, but it's actually the, the thing that I'm going to be talking about mostly, is that cytokinin is uh, very important in promoting sugar transport and the nutrition of pollen, the, or the, the male reproductive uh, components. So for branching, you know, I won't go into too much detail on these other functions, but 
essentially there's, a, there's an interplay between auxins such as IAA and cytokine in, in which these two uh, factors primarily with, with a few other new, new factors, but they can regulate the outgrowth of a bud. Uh, uh, senescence, uh, well, in this case, cytokinin abundance, if it's kept high, it can re uh, reduce or delay the senescence. So these are some tobacco plants that, that I grew. And uh, you'll notice that on the left here, the, the lower leaves are senescing naturally. This is what happens when they get old. But if you treat them with, uh, externally with cytokinin, you notice that they don't senesce so much. So this, this type of approach has been, well, the approach of using cytokinin has been used uh, transgenically to overexpress cytokinin in the plant, but I found that you can also do this by applying cytokinin from the outside. So it's just a good way of, of confirming, uh, not only confirming the, the explanation for how it works, but finding that you can do it with non-transgenic methods by just applying it from the outside. Um, so specific to the grower or the, you know, the, the money side of this, uh, heat damages yield. So some, some early work was done with this model plant, Arabidopsis, which many of you probably in the university here know all about, but it's a, a brassica, uh, which is used as a model plant for science research. It's very small and it's a very fast generation from one plant to the next. Um, anyway, it has great genetic resources, great research resources, and it was used in this paper to show um, the specific time, uh, the specific time during development that is most vulnerable to heat. Okay, so to make a long story short here, the, the problems happen primarily during two periods. One is during meiosis when, when the uh, the pollen is dividing and it's being formed inside the plant before you ever see it. And the second one is, is during pollen shed when the, the plant is actually trying to fertilize its flowers. Um, so I started out by looking with Arabidopsis at this problem to see what we could, what we could do. And one, one of the first things I found out is that if you grow this plant uh, under constant hot uh, conditions, 37C or body temperature, it looks more or less normal. It grows about the same. It makes flowers, but not a single one of the flowers are fertile. They don't make any pods, zero. So it's an extreme case where, you know, everything can look okay, but you get nothing as far as productivity. So 37 degrees was a little bit too extreme, but um, if you grow them, well, if you grow them under more permissive conditions, I will get to this later, uh, you, can, you can kind of go in the middle between some damage but also some, some production, but we'll get there in a minute. Now, besides the pollination stage, we also have uh, problems later on during development. You can have aborted kernels in corn, you can have embryos being uh, dying because of heat, even though they may have been fertilized, they don't they don't continue to develop. Um, part of that can be due to the, you know, the uh, cytokine and not being able to uh, continue cell division, right? And also not being able to keep the, the tissue alive. Here was a paper where they grew corn under different conditions, similar to that wheat paper I showed you, and. Uh, again, I won't go into details, but essentially, if you have uh, corn grown under good conditions, you'll have a proper kind of uh, kernel in the corn. If you grow under artificial conditions that are mimicking favorable outdoor conditions, you can again get you know decent kernels. But if you grow them, uh, if you grow them under conditions of excess temperature. Uh, for a shorter period or a longer period of time, you can see what happens to the uh, to the embryos. Now the plant still survives, but the embryos are aborting, so you're not going to get any yield from this. Okay, so how so the the theory or the hypothesis is that cytokinin could help heat for, 
uh, fertility of the plant or production of the plant uh, during hot temperatures. How would that actually happen? Well, the, uh, the evidence that, that I started with, uh, or the hypothesis that I started with, is that, that cytokinin is uh, necessary uh, for continued supply of sugars to the, both the flowers as well as to the fruits. And that I think uh, if you interrupt that supply of cytokinin, you will interrupt the supply of sugars, and then you will have abortion uh, of the, the embryos or perhaps problems with the pollen before that. Uh, another thing that I didn't mention, but cytokinin is known also to promote photosynthesis in plants. So that's uh, uh, probably related to the sugar supply at the very beginning as well. Um, so sugars, right? We were talking about cytokinin pr producing and then helping to transport sugars. So some early literature actually uh, measured the amount of sugar in the anthers or the male parts of the, of the tomato flower and found that, yes, if you have uh, pollen produced under good, good uh, temperature conditions, you have more pollen. But if you have the plants grown under too much heat, you'll have low amount or lower amount of sugars in the, in the pollen. So here's some supporting evidence that sugars are, are necessary, okay? This one didn't examine cytokinin, but it examined just the sugar itself. So, okay, with these ideas in mind of cytokinin seems to have a role, sugars seem to have a role, um, I decided to test this directly with Arabidopsis. So, as I mentioned, I grew these um, under conditions where um, some reproduction would happen, but not the as much reproduction as you would normally have. So um, I believe it was 30, 35 degrees during the day and then 20, 25 at night. I may have mentioned that on another slide, but uh, anyway, what I found is that by treating these plants with uh, a couple of different uh, cytokinins here, 6BA or kinetin, we were able to get a lot more, uh, actually almost double the amount of of productivity from these plants. And by that I mean pods that were fertilized and actually set, set fruit. But also interestingly, I tested the hypothesis of sugars. So I just applied sugars to the plants from, by spraying with sucrose. And in fact, we got a similar response and in fact, even a bit of a dose responsive effect. The more sugar you gave, the, the better. And in fact, it, it could reach the level uh, with sugar alone that it reached with these with these cytokinins, and this is this was repeatable, you know, in re uh, multiple experiments. So it seems that you can use cytokinin or sucrose to uh, to improve the sugar supply and thus improve the heat uh, or the, the the set of fruit under heat uh, hot conditions. Okay. So let's put together a brief model of how this is happening. Um, as I told you, cytokinin is normally synthesized by the plant, particularly uh, there's a, a, a sort of a spike of cytokinin abundance during flowering. So the plant really needs cytokinin during flowering. Uh, it needs even more. So um, we have measured the amount of cytokinin and found that, it, that it, normally it raises up quite a bit during the flowering and then it drops off again. So that's what the plant wants to do. But if you have uh, high temperatures during uh, flowering, it's, the problem is that there's, a, there's an enzyme called cytokinin oxidase that actually breaks down cytokinin. So the plant tries to produce the cytokinin, but the hot temperatures promote this, this enzyme, cytokinin oxidase, that actually breaks it down and blocks cytokinin synthesis. So you lose the, the natural cytokinin that you would have in the plant, that the plant would need. So what we do is very simple, just uh, apply exogenous cytokinin by spraying, like I showed you in that last slide. And then we, we uh, restore, restore this, this pathway that, of what the plant is normally doing. It's cytokinin is helping to uh, make sugars by photosynthesis. And then uh, what I'll get into a little later is the sugar transport. You know, sugar is made in the leaves, but 
it's needed in the flowers and the fruits and the roots and other things, the sinks, as we call them. The source is the leaves, but that the sugar has to be moved. And this is not straightforward. There are some very uh, complicated mechanisms involved in moving that sugar. But if you can move it, you know, it will get to the places that it's needed and it will help to promote the fertilization and the fruit set. Yeah, so here's one of the, uh, how, how could cytokinins increase the sugar abundance? Well, as I said, there are these sugar transporters and uh, you don't have to look at the details here, but just understand that there's a number of different types of sugar transporters. There's many, several different gene families of, of sugar transporters. And what are those? They're proteins which actually act like pumps that are situated on uh, membranes of the cells and they specifically recognize sugar on one side and they move it across. So they're called sugar pumps in uh, common language. But there are many different ones, uh, many different types in different places. In the leaf here, in the transmitting tissue like the, the, the phloem, and also then out at the places like fruits and shoot tips. So it's uh, when you get into the deep, you know, when you look deeply, you get into, you find there's a lot of details involved with this. It's not just a simple, uh, simple thing. Okay, so one of the, f the only, um, the, one of the only examinations of the effect of cytokinin uh, on sugar transporters was done some years ago um, and was shown by this group in Germany that indeed they, uh, sugar was able to, uh, or I'm sorry, cytokinin was able to promote uh, gene expression of, of one of these hexose transporters or sugar transporters, but um, that was about all that, that, that was known until while I was actually working on this project uh, at the beginning in 2012, all of a sudden a whole new, new family of sugar transporters was discovered and was published here in Science. And this is a new, completely new group that has like about 18 or 17 members, and this was big news. So, of course, I thought, wow, I have to look at these now. I have to see about these genes. And the, uh, the nice thing about using Arabidopsis is that you can, when they d discover these genes, they publish the gene sequences, so you can immediately, very easily measure um, in the laboratory, you can measure expression of, of these genes. So that's what I did uh, on these 17 uh, AT sweet genes. And what I found is that, first of all, as I showed in that other slide, sugar transporters are not uh, universal. They're expressed at different levels in different tissues. So in this, in this one here, um, uh, what it's trying to show on this graph is the relative expression of each of these 17 genes in a, in a flower versus a uh, leaf. So we're taking one fold as the reference for the leaf expression, and if this gene is expressed more in the flower, you will have a, gra uh, a bar that's up. And if it's expressed more in the leaf than the flower, then you'll have a bar pointing down. So by doing that, uh, it's called quantitative PCR, you will be able to um, monitor sort of where are these, wh which tissues uh, are most these genes most important in? So I focused on two of them, uh, AT sweet six, because it's about five times more expressed in the leaf, whereas AT sweet seven here is about uh, actually about 65 times more highly expressed in the in the in the flower. So then, yeah, you, know, you can move directly to test the hypothesis that we mentioned before, which is, can cytokinins change how plants respond to hot conditions in terms of their reproduction? And what I found was um, that in some cases, yes, they, uh, they, they, heat uh, affects it very much. So another PCR experiment here, this one, is, this top graph is on leaf tissue, and this one is on flower tissue. So what you find is um, the blue bars tell you how much the gene is expressed under 24C, which is good conditions, and the red 
bars tell you the r relative expression under hot conditions. So what you basically see here is, for this gene, the expression drops dramatically under hot conditions. Same thing for this, this one here. It drops dramatically under hot conditions, okay? Uh, you, you might remember that I said six is a leaf-specific gene, so uh, that's the reason why I'm focusing on six. Number one, it's, it's, uh, it's leaf-specific, and number two, it's, its expression is really damaged in the leaf during, during hot conditions. Same thing if we look at the flower. Uh, sweet seven is, is a flower-specific gene, and its, uh, its expression is dramatically damaged by heat. So that's the reason I chose this one to look at. And again, the primary hypothesis was that if you have heat uh, uh, damaging the expression of, of sucrose transporters, can kinetin application help this? Kinetin being one of the cytokinins. So that's what I test here, first in that leaf gene, and what we found is that, um, again, the blue bar is the, the level of expression of the gene under good conditions, 24C. Thir uh, red, red bar here is under 35C. And then the green bar is under 35C, but then you apply some cytokinin to it. And what you notice is that, yes, it drops off a lot during heat, but then you can recover it by having uh, cytokinin uh, put onto it here. And this is the same thing, only a different, a higher dosage of cytokinin. So, so this one is actually sort of rescued. This expression of this gene is rescued by cytokinin. What, what does that matter? You know, what, what does it mean that it rescues it? Okay, it means that it allows the expression to, to try to come back, and there, therefore the gene can, can act again to help sugar transport, remember, or sugar transport tr sugar movement out of the leaf so that the plant can carry on what it's trying to do. Uh, the same thing I found for the uh, flower expression of AT sweet 7. Again, you can rescue the expression of that gene by applying uh, kinetin. In fact, in the higher dose of kinetin, you can not only rescue it, but you can even bring it up above what it, what it was under good conditions. Even though you have heat, you can still uh, rescue the expression to even better than it was under, under cooler conditions. So this kind of was a good, a good finding, and it was a good suggestion that maybe this gene is important, uh, and may, maybe it's a good way of, uh, or how should I say, maybe this is a key of how cytokinin works. Okay, maybe, it's, maybe cytokinin is working by by recovering the expression of this gene that's key for sugar transport, okay? So then, to really, to really um, be, be very confident about how this works, you can do uh, the next stage, which is the genetic, uh, the genetic side of this research. Well, because we were working in Arabidopsis, you can sometimes get uh, specific mutant lines, what that means is that uh, universities have spent a lot of money and time to make specific uh, lines or, let's say, varieties of Arabidopsis that have only one gene knocked out, or one gene has lost its function. And this is useful for researchers to understand the function of that specific gene. In other words, if you have a, a wild type that's normal and you have this mutant that has only one gene damaged, then you test and you see how do these plants perform under a specific stress. If, if they perform the same, then you conclude that gene probably wasn't very important for the plant. But if that mutant with only that one gene damaged, if it suddenly has a different response, then you have very good, we call genetic evidence that this gene is important for function under that condition. So we obtained this, uh, the mutant for this AT Suite 7, which is, again, the sugar transporter that's flower-specific, and confirmed that, yes, this, this, uh, this mutant plant has lower, uh, lower expression of AT Suite 7. It's not a complete knockout because it does have some expression, but it's, it's much less than the, the uh, wild-type uh, expression.
Okay, and then we used that to, to do our, you know, our genetic test um, to, to confirm the function of that gene in our uh, area of interest, which is the, the heat resistance. So if you grow this uh, mutant line and the wild type under normal conditions, you don't have any significant difference in the number of, of pods that are produced. Um, if you grow it under uh, hot conditions, um, you also don't have a great deal of difference. Uh, you might think, well, wait, that's a problem because shouldn't it be lower? No, because this one has the, the gene knocked out by a genetic uh, mutation, but remember that the wild type also has the expression of the gene decreased a lot by heat, so this is not a surprise either. But the key, the real test is, can you recover the number of, or the fertility, can you recover the fertility of, of the wild type uh, differently than, than, than you can of the mutant, and yes, you can. There was significantly less recovery possible on this mutant, so what that means is, we've confirmed that the kinetin treatment acts uh, at least partly through this, uh, this specific gene to promote fertility because these two uh, plants don't recover to the same degree. This mutant cannot, cannot recover by cytokinin like the wild type could. So now we have genetic evidence that, that this uh, mechanism is, is correct to explain uh, what happened. Okay, so now the next question of those, of course, okay, that's all very nice, but what does that mean for growers? What does it mean out in the field? Okay, so then we move now to that, to that subject, what happens in the field when we apply cytokinins. Okay, so this was a first experiment done on beans uh, in the University of California, and what we found was indeed, if you, if you apply a cytokinin solution under hot conditions, uh, in the field, you will get an increase in, in yield, and in fact, an increase that's proportional to the dose of, of uh, cytokinin that you applied. This is the, the beans with, with the shell, and this is after removing the shell, same, same kind of thing. But yeah, so we have some evidence here that cytokinin application under hot conditions can increase yield, and we have statistical significance for that on these uh, two higher doses. Okay, what about other crops like corn? Well, these, uh, in Argentina, they often face this kind of problem of hot conditions during, during pollination. So they conducted a number of trials with cytokinin and they got an average yield increase of 10% by applying the cytokinin uh, average of all these trials. So this was, you know, very, very, um, 80% uh, of the, the, the trials had a positive response, and the average yield increase was 10%. So this is, this is quite important um, to show that this works in, in a major crop like corn. Okay, how about barley, malting barley? Uh, this trials was done by, um, well, collaboration between Stoller and AB InBev, which is formerly known as Anheuser-Busch. This is, I think, one of the largest brewing, brewing companies in the world, and we conducted trials with them in three st states in the United States, Idaho, uh, North Dakota, and Minnesota. And what we found in these three trials was that in each case, we, we got very similar yield increases on, uh, with this treatment of cytokinin. And in fact, we had yields uh, b increases between 12 and, and, 17, uh, and 21 percent, which is, yeah, great. I mean, that's, they were very excited about this, and uh, um, that's, that's not easy <laughs> to get, this kind of increase in yield. Um, as an example of, you know, what you see with the, the, the grain, you know, with the cytokinin, you get fatter grains, and this is particularly important for malting barley because if you have, uh, if you want to make beer, you need to have very fat grain with a lot of starch in it. So uh, this is very useful. Uh, this one was done at a different timing, but essentially it's the same, the same kind of result. Um, all three trials gave yield increases. Uh, uh, with, uh, with significant uh, 
at least in two of them, we had significantly greater statistics. Okay, uh, this one is a trial that was done in Spain by, uh, with, uh, we collaborated with KWS, a uh, seed company, and they grow, they grow, in this case, beet seeds. This was done in Aguilar de Campu, and it was two, two f different field trials which, uh, in which they tried uh, applying the cytokinin during flowering. They asked me because they have problems with seed production in, in, you know, because of heat in Spain, and so they wanted to try this, so that's what we did, and this was, um, the, the result is that they did, yeah, they got a great increase in yield, in fact, an amazing increase in yield. They almost, they more than doubled their yield in this, in this particular trial here of large purified beet seed. It's, again, they're seed growers, so that's what they want. That's where they make their money. Uh, these were genotype crosses. Since they're a seed company, they're using breeding lines to make new, new hybrids, and so they tried a couple of different crosses, and they found positive response in both of them to the cytokinin. And this is actual uh, number of seeds produced. And you see here, there's even a bigger increase in the actual number of seeds produced. So uh, again, this is not typically what we get. It's not usually that good. But they were more than happy to, to get this kind of result. And so uh, I think that it can vary by genotype, the kind of, uh, the kind of response you get. But I think that in these breeding programs, they are using some genotypes that they have specific uh, advantages for one purpose, but they may be deficient in other things. And so that could be part of the explanation for why they have such, such a m massive uh, response here. But we're, we're continuing to look into that with them. Okay, that's, that's what I have here, but I wanted to thank everyone who's involved in this work. It's a worldwide project, and um, USA, South America, Mexico, and Stoller Europe, and KWS right here in, uh, in Europe. So thank you to all of them, and thank you to all of you for your, your attention. If you have questions. <laughs>just on the table. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. A short uh, question for a, a, a sure uh, response. Does um, uh, this uh, um, Stoller products includes cytokinons uh, in, uh, in, uh, in their production, in their uh, products? Well, we are using, in these experiments, we are just using pure cytokinin. So um, it's, not, um, it's not designed to test the, the commercial products. So again, I work in discovery, so my job is to create new products. But when we, when we get to applied research after we come up with a new product, we pass it to another group of researchers within our company and they test and test and finally they will come up with a named product but but what I have tested here is just just kinetin just cytokinin yeah okay. mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. next one I, I think is Dr. Maya uh, Thank you, Ron, for, for this amazing presentation. It sounds like music to hear a plant physiologist. Thank you. But my, my, my question is, uh, under, under heat stress, you know that uh, stomatal conductance uh, decrease very much. Mm. So decreasing stomatal conductance, we have an imbalance in the hydraulic transportation in plants, including the, the relationship between xylem and phloem. 
So uh, it's expected that uh, the transportation of sucrose decrease also. So my question is, uh, uh, what is the, the relation between this uh, uh, lower expression and the uh, sucrose transportation and the, and the dynamic of stomatal conductance? Because you know that uh, cytokines has a regulation on the stomach. So yeah. you measure stomato to, to infer what is the part from uh, sucrose and, and what is stomato are regulating this transportation? Yeah, a good question. Yeah, as you said, you know, cytokinin is, is known to also promote st stomatal opening or maintain stomatal opening. And part of uh, that, that is part of the reason why it can uh, improve photosynthesis. You have to have stomata open in order to do photosynthesis. So I didn't uh, show this kind of parameter about stomatal conductance, but uh, I think that because of what the literature has already established about uh, promoting photosynthesis and opening stomata, I think it's a very safe assumption that, that this was also happening here uh, in my experiments, even though I didn't uh, measure that one. I was measuring specifically the, the sugar transport. But uh, yeah, I have done other, uh, other projects, in fact, where I did measure, I used radio-labeled CO2 fed to the plant and then monitored the the incorporation of that carbon dioxide into sugar and then also followed that sugar to the sinks and found that by treating uh, with cytokinin among other things I you increase not only the fixation but but also the movement uh, I didn't put it in this talk but um, yeah so I think you're right yeah I think it happens anyone else yeah Thank you, Mr. Saltman. It was a brilliant presentation. I'm Themis Papadimas from Greece. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to make you a question. Instead of cytokinins, uh, mm -hmm. the application of this kind of hormones, regarding that auxins uh, can be produced by the plant, cut, cannot be produced by the plant above 30 mm -hmm. degrees, right. do you recommend instead of cytokinins to apply auxins also in this type of heat stress? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, actually, uh, when I was working on this, a, a paper came out, I can't remember, if, I believe it was a nature paper where they actually used a, uh, an auxin production mutant to show <laughs> essentially the same thing, that if you have this auxin production mutant, you can't, um, you can't have, uh, you, or you can mimic the, the uh, the same effect as heat, meaning that you, you have a decrease. So apparently auxins are also important in, in heat uh, tolerance or heat reproductivity. It's a whole other project to sort of time dive in and figure out what's going on there, you know, because as far as I know, auxins are not so involved in sugar transport or photosynthesis, but they, they <laughs> despite it being a science paper, they didn't show any any kind of physiology or any kind of details, and I was really wondering, you know, wow, I'd like to know more. But uh, anyway, they showed that it that it that it it is important. So perhaps perhaps we can look at that as well. But uh, should we apply auxins? Um, I guess you can do that. I, I suppose that uh, this paper showed that it can be helpful. But I only have the experience of the cytokinins. So thank you, Professor. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other question from the tenders? Yeah. Vicente, por favor, te agradecería que me hicieras la traducción. Okay. Eh, mi pregunta es muy parecida. Eh, excuse a... me, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry, sir. I cannot hear the, the tender. Mi pregunta es muy parecida a, a la del compañero. Eh, Se ha intentado. Eh, evitar esa bajada endógena de citoquininas 
debido al estrés hídrico eh, por la aplicación de aminoácidos reguladores osmóticos, o sea, si son producidos por ese estrés hídrico, se ha intentado o se ha experimentado la aplicación de reguladores osmóticos como glicina, betaína y prolina para evitar esa bajada interna endógena de citoquininas? Uh, well, I don't, I don't know if you understand I'm, it because I, maybe I, I, I know that you can speak Spanish, but ask, anyway. Maybe I try. Are you asking, yeah, yeah, yeah. does uh, the amino acids, could they... Um, operate by uh, the same method to, to, or through cytokinins maybe, to promote the survival of the plant under hydric no. stress or no? No, he tried to ask about if it's possible to, to reach the same, the same um, reactions and the same uh, solution, mm -hmm. uh, trying to avoid this cytokinin drop down with amino acids uh, such as glycina, betadina, or any other osmotic regulators I see, yeah, okay. Um, to be honest, I don't know. I haven't tested that. Um, it's possible, but I don't think I know of any evidence to show that amino acids uh, control the cytokine in abundance. Um, I can't say no, but I can't say yes either. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm being honest, right? I'm trying to be scientific here. <laughs> Thank you. But, but I should point out that um, although uh, heat is often associated with drought, uh, this, these, ex well, at least my laboratory experiments were separating those two. The plants always had plenty of water, uh, so the effects I was seeing were not caused by drought at all. They were strictly due to the heat, okay? Just wanted to mention that because I hadn't said before. Any other questions? Okay, so we are going for a break. We will have one hour and a half in order to enjoy about, about the lunch. Um, we will see again in, in not too much time because, because uh, we have to proceed with the, with the schedule. And uh, remember that if you have any kind of intolerance, you have just to explain directly to the register table, right? So see you in an hour and a half.